Thanks for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. For the foreseeable future, you're not going to hear our normal intro or outro here. We're going to be releasing episodes very frequently as things are changing. This channel will be used for a very specific purpose. Number one, to communicate with our patients. We're somewhat overwhelmed, and the more we can communicate breaking news and recommendations from us to our patients all at once, the better. So if you're a patient, we're here for you if you need us. But if possible, please tune in here so we can both keep you up to date and conserve our time for the most critical tasks. Feel free to share this with friends and colleagues as well. Number two, we've organized as a group. We have infectious disease specialists, ER doctors, critical care doctors, and in total dozens of MDs, PhDs, and frontline clinicians who are going to be constantly evaluating the news and emerging evidence. We're then going to summarize and translate that for you here every day on the podcast. The speed of change with the circumstances will make us look foolish at times, but we're committed to pouring all of our resources and energy into doing what we can to help and make a difference. You can also follow our updates at wildhealth.com or our Instagram account at wildhealthmd. And if you're a patient, we're here for you. Please tune in here for the updates and let us know how we can help. Dr. Weingart, thank you for joining us. I know everyone is extremely busy. Uh, you're in New York. Um, if you don't know who Dr. Scott, we- Scott Weingart is, um, you're probably not a physician and you're definitely not a critical care physician. Um, Scott is a close friend, but he also is who I consider to be the most critically thinking critical care doctor uh, that I know. Uh, his opinion really matters, uh, and people listen to him around the world because what he's he's very honest too that's what i love about you scott when i i've got some questions i want to ask you and i know when you answer the question um if you don't know you're going to tell us uh and that's great in these times where there's a lot of uncertainty around yeah i got no problem looking ignorant or stupid so it works out well yeah it's nice that humility is just really necessary especially in this time uh, and what's going on so what i really want to address right now and we're going to do this quickly is healthcare providers um, they're out there. If we as healthcare providers, and this is a podcast specifically for physicians, if you're not a physician, feel free to listen in, but this may not really apply to you at all. But I want to talk to healthcare providers because if we're taken out, then the situation is much, much worse. Um, we are good at taking care of critically ill patients, but not if we're sick, not if we're incapacitated. And there's some really kind of scary statistics. Um, an interesting one I, I just saw is in uh, in China, for some reason, the healthcare providers were affected more negatively than other people in the same age and uh, the same cohorts. It was up to 15% ended up critically ill, which really terrified me when I heard that because there aren't that many ICU doctors like you, Scott. Um, so I really want to talk about how to protect ourselves. So the first question I just have for you is, you're in New York, you're on the ground, what are you seeing right now? We're at the beginning of the surge. Um, you know, it seems to have started out west and is now moving uh, all across the country. So we've seen up. We have positives in our hospital, but not many critically ill yet because it's just been at the beginning. I anticipate next week is when we will really have our acid test. So uh, you'd have to talk to some of our friends in Washington State to, I think, really get a picture on the ground of how bad it could be. Yeah, I talked to a patient last night. I was up um, pretty late. Actually, one patient in L.A. and one in New York who both are having symptoms. And the one in New York, the question for me was, should I go in and get tested? And, and um, I asked them about their local hospital, and they had five positive tests that day. And I said, do not go into that place. Like, Of course. Oh, just don't do it. Yeah. Uh, that's worrisome when there's that many positives with the limited testing that we have. No doubt. Uh, you know, you had alluded to the Chinese experience and the healthcare provider infection rate. What's somewhat heartening is the rate in Italy seems to be less. And it's because I think they had a more universal approach to at least minimal personal protective gear. Uh, I think it wasn't until later in the uh, pandemic that uh, China started uh, really initiating the probably more than we have um personal protective gear. You see all the pictures that are coming out and they're in stuff I wish I had. I mean, they're in full on bunny suits and, and, you know, shoe protection and uh, some really extensive PPE. But I think at this stage of the game, if you're a doc, uh, you should be nowhere near patients without a surgical mask and some form of eye protection as your minimum. That's just walking around amongst patients you don't suspect. And then a higher level of PPE for patients under investigation. investigation. 
Yeah, and what I would say, so one, the Chinese pictures, a lot of times I'm, I'm wondering if that's really what's what's going on. Right, like propaganda type stuff. Yeah, but at the same time, I would be, I would say to providers, don't be nihilistic about this and don't just stay home because you're scared. There's a really encouraging study that came out of Hong Kong where I think they had like 1,300 people that came in, suspected coronavirus, really good PPE, 43 positive cases, and zero healthcare providers contracted it. So this is not something that is just fatalistic and we're going to get. I think we can actually do something here. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So tell me about, let's start on the very front lines, the paramedics and people out there. Any specific recommendations on how they could protect themselves? I, I don't think they should be treating patients, again, without a surgical mask and eye protection. I think that should be the bare minimum anyone in healthcare, if they're going near patients, is using. And I think that's uh, a relatively good baseline. If they are going to do procedures uh, that are higher risk, and the highest risk, of course, uh, the one that would be exposed to EMS would be intubation, then uh, if it's available, then a higher level of personal protection probably is warranted. And it's all going to depend on the availability of supplies. I know where uh, at my imaginary hospital, Janus General, already low on the things that we should be, you know, having huge stockpiles of like N95 masks. That's a nationwide phenomenon. So uh, you got to do the best you can. I think if you could avoid intubating these patients, that would be a better thing. Uh, if it's a short transport time, maybe the back of an ambulance, that little closed space with not much ventilation, not the best place to do an intubation. Yeah, I still do some ER shifts and uh, actually... This morning, uh, I was talking to a place, and someone came through the hospital and stole all of the masks, uh, oh, which is just geez. a horrific crime um, in these times. And and they were actually out, completely out of anything but small N95s, which is obviously useless if that's not your size. So, you know, wh- you know what I want to say, Matt, and this is an option for most of our friends in the pre-hospital environment, is if you could, if you have to intubate, just do it outside. Outside the ambulance, outside the house, you take the patient on a, a scoop uh, or whatever you got and, and just do it on your gurney outside the ambulance. And that is safer than negative pressure rooms. That is the way to go. And this is a very grim situation I'm going to just lay out. But what if uh, these providers were out of PPE and do not have a, a mask and, and eye protection, anything that they could do other than being outside? I mean, without that, you're, you're kind of in bad shape. But the outside, I think, is very protective. I mean, uh, when they were in, in more uh, under-resourced areas having to do tuberculosis testing and they don't have negative pressure rooms, the infection rate of doing it outside is, is it's, I think it's zero in, in all the studies I've seen. So I, I think even if it's cold, that's worthwhile. Uh, if you don't have the PPE you need, then use nature's PPE. Mm-hmm. So let's go into the emergency room then. The patient's arrived. Uh, you're talking about intubation, so let's get specific about intubation. You're the, the guru in that. Walk me through the basic steps uh, for someone intubating to minimize their risk and others' risk. Yeah, so uh, this is all based on conjecture and extrapolation, so I'll put that out there. And then you have to check your local hospital's equipment to make sure it's actually workable because there's going to be a, a lot of uh, differences between manufacturers and what's good and what's not. But uh, in the ideal world, when you still have PPE, I think, again, this is the highest risk procedure, you know, aside from the things we just won't do anymore, like bronchoscopy or nebulization. So intubations probably of the ones we will still consider doing on a high risk uh, PUI person under investigation or a known COVID patient, intubation is probably the highest risk. So uh, you want a higher level of personal protective equipment, which means if you got an N95 or N99 mask, uh, some form of full face protection if you have it. And then all of the fomite blocking stuff like, uh, you know, a full gown or a bunny suit, some kind of head protection, double gloves. Uh, You know, if if you think you could get it off safely without contaminating yourself, maybe shoe coverings. That's a a big area of controversy because I find, I don't know about you, Matt, if I put those on, I can't get them off there. They are like just built to make me fall on my butt as I'm trying to get them off my (laughs) shoe. Um, So you, you have that high level. If you have it, negative pressure room is the way to go on these. And I would almost advocate saving your negative pressure room for these kind of procedures rather than putting one patient in there and then just your negative pressure room because most EDs don't have more than one or two. uh, They're just gone. Uh, So I'd save one of them for high-risk procedures like intubation. Uh, You get a buddy 
making sure your PP is good when you go in. You go in there, and now the first thing we do is we put on a non-vented, non-invasive mask. Um, these are what we would use to do non-invasive on our ventilators with a viral filter. Now, it's unknown whether these viral filters get down small enough to filter the coronavirus. You know, some of them are three microns, some of them are smaller. So you got to check with your hospital's respiratory department. Does this work or not? Because otherwise, you know, you're not accomplishing anything. But if your filter does filter coronavirus, then putting that on with a non-invasive mask, all of a sudden, all those patients' exhalations are now through a filter. Now, there might be some leak around the mask, but it's going to be very minimal compared to what there would be without that mask on. And then what I would do is I attach a BVM to that device, but I'm not going to plan on squeezing it at this point. I just put a BVM on there and hook that up to high flow FiO2 from the wall because uh, the high flow doesn't translate to the actual tip of the BVM. So you're not putting like 20 liters into your patient and then like simulating uh, a, a high flow aerosolized situation. All that comes out of the tip of that BVM is, is very minimal flow, one or two liters. And, but what will happen is now when the patient breathes, they're breathing hundred percent FiO2 in a way that's safe to you. Tell me if any of that doesn't make sense so far, Matt. It does. A specific question I have about that is I remember about a decade ago, um, as an emergency medicine trainee, I learned a really cool trick from a brilliant critical care doctor from New York. I can't remember his name. I think it was Dr. Scott Weingart about high flow nasal cannula apneic oxygenation, which worked really well and gave me a lot of time, but it seems like not the time for that because you can potentially aerosolize more. Is that, would you agree with that assessment as being the expert uh, in kind of creating uh, that technique? Well, uh, uh, it, it, I am as expert as I think anyone could be, again, on, based on conjecture, but I totally agree with you. I think any high flow nasal cannula is just custom built to put enormous pressures into the airway and and vent that out to the environment. So I don't think it's a it's a great idea. I don't think high flow apneic oxygenation is necessary. I don't think high flow as a non-invasive technique is a great idea. Um, even in a negative pressure room, I'm not all that crazy about it, though that's the only place I would even consider it. But I don't do apneic oxygenation on these patients. I do usually put a nasal cannula on them underneath the non-invasive mask, but it's not to achieve high flow apneic oxygenation. It's to power the peep valve that I will add to these BVMs because um, they don't work in a low flow state. They only work if there's some pressure underneath the mask. And you could accomplish that with, I think, I, and this again is all bench top. I, I wish, you know, we had real studies on this, but, you know, six liters nasal cannula uh, underneath your non invasive mask with a BVM attached to it with a peep valve uh, with a viral filter in between the BVM and the non invasive mask uh, should achieve. PEEP, and therefore we'll have both PEEP in the pre oxygenation period and PEEP during the apneic period. So I have a video on this on MCRIT that explains it much better than I can in words, uh, but that's what we're doing right now. But again, all this has to be checked out with your individual manufacturers. And tell me about the viral filters you mentioned, because I work at, uh, I've worked at some ERs where I don't think they would know what that even is or means if I asked for it. Is there, so it seems like something that you should identify ahead of time in your hospital because it's not a standard procedure, correct? Well, it's not standard for ED docs or critical care docs because we don't, most ED and critical care docs don't deal with the uh, granular logistics of things. They, they just, uh, they understand ventilators very well from the dials up front, but not from the actual workings of the valves and how they kept clean by respiratory. So RT uh, is the is the group of folks you want to talk to, and they know this stuff incredibly well. Uh, anything that doesn't have a washable uh, filtration system on the vent will have these viral filters on them because it's what keeps the ventilators from being contaminated. So uh, almost certainly there are ventilators in your hospital that require these filters. Therefore, they're there. But you have to talk to RT and say, do we have enough? Uh, what kind do we have? Will they filter corona? And if the answer to those is yes, then you, you have them. You just have to get them to the line. You have to get them to the ED so that you could actually stick them between your BVM and any other device you're putting on the patient. I want this ideally between my BVM and endotracheal tube. So what this will do is all the exhalations that would come out of that ET tube, even though you have a sealed endotracheal tube in the trachea, uh, are just venting to the room, which is less than ideal. If you have a viral filter in there that could filter coronavirus and you put that between your BVM and your ET tube, all of a sudden now everything that makes it out of that BVM is much, much safer. And so we uh, have a viral filter on top of whatever device is touching the patient's face or trachea um, so that the room is not contaminated.
Mm, that's great. So we've got the patient intubated. You made an interesting point about the shoe covers earlier and difficult to get them off. That's an issue. I, I, there's some data on exposure to some virus. I think it was uh, maybe in the Ebola outbreak where I saw some literature about the exposure really happened taking the PPE off. I, any tips for – because normally we get somebody intubated, a critically ill patient – you kind of take a deep breath, you're high-fiving, but that's still a critical period as well, correct? Any yeah, buddy system that? is the way to go. I think it's the only way to go. Um, you, you want someone who is watching you and helping you. And uh, one additional tip and trick, and your hospital probably has either adopted the CDC videos on this or have made their own, so you got to use local stuff. But uh, you come out of that room and you take out your outer pair of gloves and I would actually wash down with, uh, you know, the cleaning wipes or uh, some form of alcohol uh, foam or what have you, those gloves before you touch anything and then just keep doing that during the entire doffing procedure such that if you do contaminate your gloves, um, you're now cleaning them back up before you touch anything. And then uh, obviously you just try to do it in a ritualized order that prevents you from getting anything in your eyes and mucous membranes. This is not, you know, something absorbed through the skin. So really your worries from fomite transmission are you're going to touch something that's been exposed and then touch either your mucous membranes or your eyeballs. So really that's what the buddy's job is, is to make sure that you are not contaminating gloves without cleaning them in between in a way that's going to allow you to touch somewhere on your face. Gotcha. So going back to the patient, you have them intubated. Are there any specific ventilator settings, uh, anything else, any other, any other changes to standard care than uh, just a regular ARDS patient, which it seems like a lot of these are presenting as? Yeah. So, and this is all, you know, out of doctor's experience in China and Italy, there's nothing, you know, confirmed, there's nothing rigidly studied, but, uh, ours net strategy makes a lot of sense. So go with that. Uh, what we are hearing from our colleagues that have dealt with a lot more of these critically ill vented patients is they have very compliant lungs, meaning that they're not going to generate high plateau pressures from these low tidal volume settings. And they might tolerate a bunch of peep uh, which, you know, you might think they need because their sats are not great. But the problem we're hearing is that the reason these lungs might be so compliant, so easy to ventilate without generating high pressures, is you're actually damaging the infrastructure of those pulmonary areas. And therefore, uh, putting them on a high peep, even though they might tolerate it, even though their plateau pressures may stay low, may actually be injurious. So uh, you want to stay minimal, as as little as you get away from, uh, get, away, get away with, rather, um, to keep them oxygenated some reasonable level. So if they could be at 90%, um, at, you know, 50% and a peep of eight, then don't shoot for 99%. That seems like the worst possible way to go. Just bare minimal settings to maintain a reasonable oxygenation. Um, rescue, I'm hearing anecdotally that the, uh, vent modes that I love, like uh, airway pressure release ventilation, um, may be a great way to go on these patients. You probably have no idea what I'm talking about, and that is perfectly fine. Uh, it's simply early referral to your pulmonary docs or whoever's caring for these patients in your hospital uh, if you start having to get higher on the PEEP. So if you're at 100% and you're, you're creeping up to 15 a PEEP, uh, that's the time at that moment to make a call and say, I think we got to do something different on this particular patient. Could you come on down and take a look? Um, you know, you don't have to go at this alone. This is uh, really something that should, has to be a team sport. So to restate, don't be fooled by, quote unquote, good compliance. ARDSnet basics are the main way to go and a quick early referral to a real specialist for this. Yep, yep that's, that sounds exactly right. What about any other changes to kind of standard protocols in the emergency department and ICU? I mean, as far as even something as simple as um, the physical exam, uh, I mean, do we start to have, I mean, we're talking about social distancing. <laughs> what about physician-patient distancing? I mean, um, is it time in these situations to scrap a few of the standard things and, and adjust in any way, ICU well, or ER? I thought it was time to scrap stethoscopes years ago. I don't think they bring much to the table. Uh, that's sticking your face right up to a patient. Um, so I don't know if that's great. If I had my druthers, I'd replace it with a ultrasound lung examination uh, right up your alley, uh, Maddie. But this is something that a lot of places, especially the Italians, my friends up there, I've spoken to, 
um, they're doing because if you screen a patient and they have beelines bilaterally, that's a high risk patient. You know, uh, how, how do you differentiate the common cold or uh, bacterial pneumonia from this? Well, uh, you shouldn't have bilateral beelines uh, across, you know, uh, and potentially subpleural uh, fusions as well. Uh, anything that's bilateral in multiple lung fields makes me feel this is more of a COVID patient than something else. So that might be the better examination. You can certainly be more distant with a probe than you can with a stethoscope. Now, the question I have, and no one has a great answer at this stage of the game, is are we contaminating our machines? And the answer is, I'm sure, definitively yes. So the way I play it is those machines are, should just be considered contaminated, and you touch them uh, as if they were you know, the patient's body. Uh, so you never touch in machines with bare hands. You know, you and I bare hand it all the time, I'm sure, but uh, probably not during this situation. But the ultrasound is one change. Um, the other change, uh, not from physical exam, but just from the basics of emergency medicine, is if you really think it's a COVID patient, uh, be really stingy with your fluids. These patients' lungs are like sponges, and that makes their uh, ARDS much, much worse. So if you can keep them dry, keep them dry. So we just recorded a uh, long ultrasound podcast with Mike Stone, who um, he's actually walked several people through remote tele ultrasound with the butterfly hooked up into their iPhone um, over the internet and kind of controlling their probe. So the last I know, you, this can't doesn't spread very well through the internet. So that's a kind of an extreme <laughs> uh, distance technique, I guess. Uh, uh, but it, that may be, I mean, interestingly enough, this is, we're going to publish that lung ultrasound for um, COVID uh, soon. But this is an evolving place where if you're in a remote place and you don't actually have the skills, that may not be a problem in the near future. There's a few people working on that problem, interestingly enough. So it's a place to watch. That's great. What about, uh, I don't want to take a ton of your time. I know you, you talk forever about treating the patients, but let's talk about real quick. Um, when you go home, I know yeah. uh, you have kids, I have kids. How do we not expose our families to this? This is not a incredibly hardy virus. Um, so normal stuff is going to kill it. So I, I think the plan, I mean, we're, I'm lucky enough, my house is uh, my entryway that the family enters in as opposed to our totally formal, never used front door, but our, our actual entrance is in the laundry room. So uh, what I do is I just come in, I, I alcohol down my hands, I take off all the clothing, uh, pop it into the washing machine. I don't mind walking around nude for 20 seconds or so. And uh, I, I reprep my hands and I, I feel I'm pretty good to go to walk up to the shower and I just shower the second I get in the door. And then I come out clean and new, ready, ready for, for hugs and fun um, in terms of fomite. Now, the real question, and I don't have an answer to this, and maybe you hack away and you know as much as I do about Matt, about this, Matt, is since there is a asymptomatic period, how do I know I'm not infecting um, my kid while I'm asymptomatic? Well, I take some solace in the fact that through all of the countries that have dealt with this, the infection rate with severe infection amongst kids is uh, really, 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 really low. Um, so I, I feel even if my kid is exposed, I'm not going to get him really sick. It usually presents as just a, a cold for all intents and purposes. Um, my wife's a doc. She's more exposed than I am. Um, so uh, I feel like if anything, she's going to give it to me. So I feel pretty safe, but this is a big issue. And I don't know what have you, I can't walk around my house in a surgical mask. I think that would just be pushing the limits of, uh, silliness. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, so my approach when I come home, this may be a bit overkill, I park uh, half a mile away, take all my clothes off, set the car on fire, and walk nude home uh, just to make sure. Yeah, yeah no, um, it, so, I, it's a little bit much, but I can hear your reason. That makes sense. No, I'm, I'm obviously joking. So um, I, same thing that you do. I'll tell you one thing I'm considering, um, Scott, and I'd like to get your opinion on this, is first off, I totally agree with you about the kids. Um, however, I'm not really worried about the kids, but I look at kids as potentially – a vector, almost like a, a tick with this disease. So I'm worried about my kid actually exposing other family members who may be vulnerable. Um, so would add that risk in. One thing I'm considering and I haven't fully decided is when I look at there's some brand new literature out just in the last um, few days. I mean, it's, it's continuing to emerge. It's not in the last few days. It came out, but we're getting more and more information around it is, is actually chloroquine um, for malaria in it. There's, I know some physicians, and I'm evaluating, I'll probably make a decision for myself in the next day or two, who it looks like the combination of zinc um, and then uh, chloroquine as a zinc ionophore transporter into the cell, the combination of the zinc and once a week, 400 to 500 milligrams of chloroquine, it looks like it may be an interesting prophylaxis. And there are obviously no randomized controlled trials on this, but we're not going to get 
that type of data. Do you have any thoughts on healthcare providers once a week trying to prophylax if you're constantly being exposed to this? I, I don't know. I mean, this is an area we would need evidence, but I think it really doesn't matter that much, Maddie, because unless you have special sources, chloroquine is back ordered in every manufacturer I found in the U.S. Uh, for individual prescription. Um, so it's kind of academic. Uh, so, uh, it doesn't really matter that much unless you have a hidden source to another country's supplies. I don't think it's available out there. Um, I would love to hear from you. This is your Ballywick. Uh, if, if there was not a prescription med and you've already mentioned zinc, are there other immuno boosters you actually think there's reasonable data for? Yeah, we published, we've got a, actually a PDF that we've sent out to our patients. And then we did a podcast on the Ben Greenfield podcast and talked about ours. But um, I mean, I, I mean, I'm answering this question every day. I had a patient last night in New York City, who texted me um, and their uh, wife had symptoms and said, Look, I have no idea if she has it. Here's what she can do. It's very low risk. And I said, um, high dose vitamin D, there's some interesting data, uh, high dose vitamin C, uh, the zinc, I think is pretty harmless. Um, elderberry, uh, a few other things like that, which I have no idea if they'll help, but they just seem to be immune boosting with very little downside. So it's some basics and we have published and we'll put out on Instagram too our PDF of the things. Now here's the problem, Scott. The, we made this little packet of, of immunity boosting things and uh, we published it and now they're all on back order from the from right. company of course. like it. Um, and, but the one I would say that I like the data the most is potentially quercetin. So there's a Canadian Montreal group that um, is doing some studies in Italy right now and some really interesting data on quercetin, which is very, very, very low risk and may have some antiviral effects. But again, that one is hard to get. I was just, my office staff was texting me this morning that the large amount of quercetin we ordered on Friday is on back order. So if you can get it, great. If you got it in your house, great. But, um, Things are getting difficult. How would, you, how would you even spell that, Matt? I've never heard of this stuff. I'm sorry, quercetin. It's a flavonoid. Um, and uh, it, there's a, a quercetin product from Thorn, which is in New York that we like, but it's on back order. Uh, but on Amazon, you can potentially find some sources for that as well. Um, I'll, I'll email you, Scott, the studies. There's four, actually four studies um, out, of, out of Italy of quercetin. I'll email them to you to see you have them so you can make your own opinion on it. All right. And the last thing, because I, I don't want to take a ton of your time on Sunday, um, and this, this applies to this question, what about rest and recovery, other than ignoring people like me who ask for an interview, um, what are you doing? Because obviously, so I got an email from uh, a physician in an ICU that was somewhat scary to me, and they talked about half of their night doctors being incapacitated, which meant the other half are working twice as hard, which means their immunity is going to be depressed and they're that much more likely to get this. So what are you doing for yourself outside of the hospital to boost your immunity? Well, I mean, you guys have spoken about this so much, but I think it's key is you got to sleep. And if that means you're the type of person who worries when they're not at work about going back to work or, or the disaster or your financial portfolio and you're up all night, you're hosed. I, I think sleep may be the most important thing you could do for protection and recovery. And so that means uh, you need to find a way to turn off your brain. And, you know, it, unfortunately, it's going to be, I think, kind of rough. I mean, you might disagree, Matt, to develop a meditative practice or some form of mindfulness to turn off your brain now in the midst of all this. It might be the most, you know, difficult time to develop that kind of practice. Um, and uh, I don't know. Uh, people have to sleep. I'm curious to hear, Matt, what you think about um, sleep aids in this setting. Are we hurting or helping with things that uh, may preserve REM sleep like Zolpidem or some of the others? Um, you know, I, I think things like uh, antihistamines are not the way to go. I think the sleep you get is garbage. But if you had the choice between someone sleeping one hour a night because they were racked with anxiety versus using a sleep aid, what's, what's your, your opinion, opinion Matt? Yeah, that's a great question. The way you put it uh, makes it difficult too, the, the one hour versus that. But um, I'll tell you, I'm someone who sleeps uh, incredibly well, have no, has no problems, but that's not been the case the last three or four nights um, just because there's so much to do and so much to think about. Um, so I am a fan of sleep aids, but not Zopidem or, or antihistamines. So that I'll come, I guess I'll go to that extreme case in a minute. But for me, last night was different. I Like last night, I was up late um, trying to call in some things for a patient in L.A. and a patient in New York. And when I finally was off the phone, 
I said, I'm taking <laughs> something. So I actually took high dose CBD and I took some melatonin. I don't take melatonin normally, but I feel like it's really low risk. And it is a very difficult time to develop a practice of meditation, but anyone can at least take some deep breaths and just doing that for 10 minutes is probably going to calm the sympathetic system down a little bit. And then if you need a chemical calmer down of the sympathetic system, you could think about something like phosphatidylserine. So maybe a combination of things, not having to reach for the zopidem, um, maybe could get you there. Um, I don't know if I'm ready to answer the question of one hour sleep 